May the God of all mercy, peace, and grace, who's called you and me to faith, make you confident guardians of the faith and fearless proclaimers of the truth. Amen. God's word that we had chosen for today's meditation is our epistle lesson from 2 Timothy chapter 1. You may want to open up to that in your pew Bible on page 1155 as we go together in that study. And we pray now. Holy Spirit, sanctify us. That is, set us apart by your truth. Your word alone remains saving truth. Amen. Fellow guardians of the faith and proclaimers of the truth. You know, every generation seems to have their share of slogans. Here's a blast from the past. Keep the faith, or keep the faith, baby. That particular slogan is suggesting that that people hang in there, that they stay the course, that they don't lose hope. Things will change. Hang in there, baby, hang in there. That, That slogan of optimism and perseverance and encouragement lands squarely on the text that the Apostle Paul wrote as he shared his second letter with young Pastor Timothy. This would be his last writing by the Holy Spirit's direction. His last will and testament, so to speak. But even though his ministry was coming to an end, And he realized that his head would be on the chopping block and he would suffer a martyr's death. No regret. He'd be home with his dear Savior pretty soon. And and even though that was true, he wanted to have a face-to-face contact with Timothy one more time. But if that were not possible, the Spirit led him to write this particular letter, very intense, very personal, to his fellow soldier of the cross which was also written to you and me good soldiers of Christ Jesus and in that letter Paul says to us keep the faith which means first of all that we thank God for it even though Paul was in some prison in Rome and about to be executed his focus was on Gratitude filling his heart. And he knew his Savior, Jesus, personally, his dear Savior. And, and he, he was also thankful for the people surrounding him, like Timothy, a Christian to Christian, co-worker to co-worker. And so, as we hear about Paul's gratitude, we must ask ourselves, Do I daily thank God for my faith? And do I regularly thank my dear Savior for the advice, the direction, the counsel, the encouragement that he gives to me? So so through many faith family members in my home or extended family in my congregation or synod? And do I work every hard work very hard every day to bring God's words and promises to others that they long to see us that they too might be filled with joy and do we pray regularly that one line from one of our hymns so simply and let me find Lord good friends for counsel and correction Paul was deeply thankful for Timothy's faith as he was for his own faith as you and I, I pray, are also thankful because our faith, as Paul says in Romans or Ephesians 2, is a gift of God. A gift of God. And he's especially thankful for a grandma named Lois and a mom named Eunice who are responsible for taking young Timothy as a boy 
to the Old Testament scriptures in introducing to him the promised Messiah, Jesus. And that reminds us, it's been rightly said, that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Such words remind us of the inestimable, invaluable influence of moms and dads. And in some cases, those who've led their son or daughter to Jesus all alone as a single parent. Thank God for believing parents and grandparents too, who immerse themselves in God's word, who teach God's word regularly in the home, who make use of the assistance of others in Sunday schools, in elementary and high schools, where we find wonderful workshops of the Holy Spirit at work. God had given Timothy this gift of faith, but not only that, he had also given him other gifts connected to that faith. When he says to Timothy, keep the faith, he's saying, use it. Practice your faith. In verse 6 he says, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Timothy's special gift from God as a Christian disciple was being able to serve as a pastor, teaching, counseling, shepherding precious blood-bought souls. But this is but one example of how our gracious God gifts his church to whom he says, keep the faith. To whatever assignment God gives us to do, whatever role we play in the church, God calls you and me into service to cheerfully carry out our duty as his called servants. But remember, God doesn't call the qualified to faith. He qualifies, he equips those that are called. Yet one of the things that so easily cripples you and me in the use of our spiritual gifts is a spirit that Paul calls in this, in this same letter a spirit of timidity, a lack of courage. For example, that has seen a number of pastors and ministers today who cater to the itching ears of their hearers, Paul says, preaching and teaching what their hearers prefer to hear, which can lead, as Paul says later in the same chapter, to hypocrisy and in denial of faith. Paul urges us to fan into flame the gift of God, the gift that he has placed in each of us as a Christian. We all have at least one spiritual gift unique to Christianity. And yet, the only way that those gifts are ever going to be used is through our regular use and the means of grace, open Bibles, remembrance of our baptism daily, frequently flocking to the Lord's table for that strength that we need in service to him. And there the Holy Spirit fans into flame that gift providing us with the stamina, the courage, the power to take our stand facing so much opposition and rejection in the workplace or perhaps on a public college or university campus or even in a hostile family setting. And in addition to that, he especially works in us a self-sacrificing love akin to that of Christ who sacrificed his all for you and for me as full payment for all of our sins. And that self-sacrificing love is what's necessary for us to serve others together with that wisdom from above which makes us effective ministers in his kingdom of power, grace, and glory. Keep in mind, though, that as you fan into flame this gift of God, as, as, uh, as Paul did, in doing so, as it was in Paul's case, you can result, the result can be much suffering, much pain. Keep the faith then, Paul says. How, you may ask? By being proud of it. 
Not a, not a sinful pride, look at me, but this pride in Jesus, our Savior, not being ashamed to bear his name in a very hostile world. Paul put it this way in verse 8, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Even though Paul's proclaiming of the gospel put him into a nasty prison, he tells Timothy, don't be ashamed. Preach the message I preached. Not that Timothy had been ashamed, but he says, don't start being ashamed. Now because of what you see happening to me, try to imagine Timothy seeing his former teacher, his friend, about to be beheaded in a terrorist-like action. That must have shook him up. And it could have caused him just to walk away. But Paul says, don't let this deter you, Timothy, from performing your work as pastor and evangelist. Keep the faith. And that's what Paul would say to us today in our situation and circumstance. Don't apologize for a single biblical truth that the world mocks and scoffs at and doesn't like at all. Take your stand. Don't be tight-lipped about the Savior, the Savior that your neighbor needs desperately to enjoy eternal life. Celebrate who you are daily through faith, a loved child of God, and will one day inherit all of heaven's treasures. Celebrate that all things really do work together for the good of those who love God trust and serve God and to enable us to do that to be proud of our precious faith listen up to what Peter or Paul says he gives us two reasons why we ought not to be ashamed first of all he says the gospel is the power of God in Romans 1 Paul says I am not ashamed of the gospel it is the power of God unto everyone who believes. God's power is the gospel. It saves us, friends, who could never, never save ourselves in a million, billion, trillion years. It's the sole power of Jesus that saves. Jesus destroying death and bringing life. Jesus, whose willing sacrifice on a blood-stained cross in an open tomb on Easter morning, he kicked the teeth out of death. He put death to death once and for all. Death no longer holds its horrible, clenching power over you and me, forgiven sinners. Jesus does. Paul says Jesus brought life and immortality to light to the gospel. Easter makes optimists out of all of us. Jesus lives and so will we, dear friends. And so we are now honored carriers of and powerful proclaimers of that Easter truth. It's what we Christians get to do every day. So keep the faith. Be genuinely and deeply proud of that gift of faith. For it's not a shame to lose one's life, to spend it in service of this gospel, but it is a shame to spend one's life, to lose it, doing anything less. And then Paul says one more thing to keep us above ground, to encourage us. He says, to guard what has been entrusted to us. What was entrusted to St. Paul, to Timothy, has been entrusted to you and me, and that is to preach the gospel. And when Paul would be killed, the gospel continued. When Timothy later died, the gospel continued. When you and I leave this world, the gospel will continue. And we will not be disappointed on the last day. None of us. You and I know that our labor in the Lord, serving others near and far away and all of our struggles combined, in doing that, will not be in vain. As the saying goes, God promises a safe landing not a calm passage. It will not be easy being proud of our faith. But God tells us one more time with that faith, 
guard the good deposit entrusted to us. The good deposit given to Paul, to Timothy, and every believer to guard with the Holy Spirit's help is without doubt the gospel. And the words of this treasured hymn come to mind. God's word is our great heritage and shall be ours forever. Left to ourselves, though, with our human reason, and left to deal with all of the growing number of fierce detractors all around us, we mere mortals will spoil everything. But only with the help of the Holy Spirit lives in us is this guarding accomplished to God's glory. So, the Holy Church, which you and I, by God's grace, are a part of, daily we need to pray this prayer. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Amen. Amen.